Today, um, what I wanted to do is basically uh, kind of go through uh, uh, the basics of uh, how fully homomorphic encryption works. Uh, so fully homomorphic encryption, I mean, as I'll get into a bit later, basically is this kind of encryption that allows you to run uh, computations on encrypted values, right? And there's a lot of things that are really interesting about this, um, like you can do privacy preserving computation really easily. It's also an important uh, building block in uh, some uh, multi-party computation protocols. It's an important building block in a lot of the proposed um, ob obfuscation uh, protocols that people are starting to uh, come up with. And the interesting thing with fully homomorphic encryption is that it, so uh, it sounds scary. Like it's, there's a lot of, I, I feel kind of impressions that it's this uh, very complex form of cryptography. It just uh, got figured out a, only slightly a couple of years ago, and so it must be uh, really complicated to understand. And it turns out it's completely not. Like, it turns out that uh, fully homomorphic encryption protocols are uh, literally kind of simpler to fully understand, I would say, than even a lot of uh, elliptic curve-based uh, constructions. Uh, now, the reason we, we're not using fully homomorphic encryption for everything is basically because it's not very efficient, right? And it has high overhead, it has uh, ciphertexts that are very large, and I'll get into why uh, this is the case uh, fairly soon as well. Um, so to start off, um, let's uh, talk about kind of what is fully homomorphic encryption, right? Um, so the goal of uh, fully homomorphic encryption is basically to have an encryption scheme where you can compute on encrypted data, right? So if you have an encryption of X, you want to be able to turn that into an encryption of F of X for some function F um, without being able to decrypt, so without being able to determine X or determine F of X. Uh, so you can think of uh, kind of partially homomorphic encryption uh, protocols that we know about already. So if you think about even elliptic curve points, now this doesn't technically fully satisfy the definition of fully homomorphic encryption because it's not an, encry it's not an encryption scheme, it's just a uh, group that has a, a homomorphism, but if you look at elliptic curve points, uh, based, if you take some number x and you multiply it by some elliptic curve point that's the generator, and then you add uh, the generator multiplied by y, you get the generator multiplied by x plus y. Right. This is a, a, a really nice property of uh, elliptic curve points, um, basically that they do uh, uh, kind of follow this and uh, uh, distributed uh, prop property, right? And there's a lot of protocols that do make use of this, right? So in the case of uh, blockchains, for example, there is um, uh, deterministic wallets uh, that have master public keys that they uh, rely uh, on these elliptic curve homomorphisms. There's, uh, even zero knowledge proof protocols in, uh, based, based on elliptic curves, things like bulletproofs, even just signatures rely on this, home, on this kind of additive homomorphism. So it already provides a lot of value, right? And if instead of adding, you want to be able to multiply, then you can just use RSA, right? If you just use kind of simple RSA encryption, so X to the power of E, then uh, X, Y to the power of E equals X to the power of E times Y to the power of E. And so if you have the ciphertext for X and the ciphertext for Y, you can create the ciphertext for X1, right? So we have this uh, kind of family of schemes that gives us uh, additive homomorphism, and we have this family of schemes that gives us a multiplicative uh, homomorphism. Now the question is, can we uh, come up with a scheme that lets us do both, right? So can we come up with some way of making a ciphertext so that you can do both adding and uh, multiplying on ciphertexts? And if you can add and multiply, then you basically have general purpose computation, right? If you restrict your ciphertext to just being zeros and ones, then you can do pretty much every logic gate, right? So if you want to do and, then and of x and y is just x times y. Um, if you want to do or, then, well, or is basically you can kind of invert x, invert y, then you do an and, and you invert again, or you have this kind of simpler formula where you just say x plus y minus x times y, right? So if both uh, value inputs are zero, then this is obviously a zero. If um, x is one, then you know you have a one here, you have a zero here, um, and then you s uh, subtract the zero here, so you get one. If y is uh, one and x is zero, it's symmetric, so you also get a one. And then if x and y are both one, 
then you get one plus one minus one, so you also get one. Uh, for XOR, um, you can do either just X plus Y, um, and that's if uh, you don't care about the numbers staying within kind of the range zero and one, if you just care about them being even and odd, or if you care about the numbers being within the range zero and one, then you can just do X plus Y minus two times X times Y, right? So if X and Y are both one, then it's one plus one minus two and you get to zero. So if you can add and multiply, then you can do pretty much whatever uh, logic gates you want and you can do arbitrary computation. Now, it's not going to be efficient to arbitrary computation because if you imagine wanting to do some math based off of numbers, then you'll pretty much have to decompose those numbers into bits and then you'll have to turn um, your addition and your other operations into circuits and then you have to evaluate the circuits and, uh, and so you can see how kind of the complexity multiplies, but you can do it. So um, to give the intuition uh, around how these um, FHE protocols work, we'll start with a kind of toy protocol. And this is, I believe, technically secure under some kind of very, very unfavorable um, key sizes and, uh, and complexity. But like, this is the way that people started uh, kind of Fig figuring out how to, um, how to be able to do addition and multiplication, right? So imagine your private key is a big prime, uh, so, and think of it as like a really big prime number. Then to encrypt um, a message where a message um, is restricted to either zero or one, uh, then what you do is basically you take a big random number, then you multiply it by P, then you add together a small random number multiplied by two, and you add your message. Right, so what we have here is basically we have a multiple of P that's offset by um, some noise and a message that's hidden in the least significant bit of the noise. And if you want to decrypt, then you decrypt the ciphertext with uh, the key by basically saying it's the ciphertext mod P in brackets and th that kind of kicks out this term. And then you just do mod two and that kicks out this term and so you have your M mod left. Um, by the way, if people have, uh, questions at any point, uh, please feel free to ask. I'm happy to answer. Uh, so why is uh, this scheme additively homomorphic, right? So basic, why is this kind of approach where you encrypt a message by um, taking a big multiple of your key, adding, a small, um, adding some noise, and then hitting your message in the least significant bit of the noise? Why is this additively homomorphic? Well, basically, if you imagine you have two ciphertexts, each one of these ciphertexts is going to be a multiple of P plus some noise plus a message, multiple of P plus some noise plus a message, and these things just kind of naturally distribute, um, distribute, right? So basically, the CT1 plus CT2 actually is a ciphertext. Like it's a ciphertext in the correct format because you just have a multiple of P, that is K1 plus K2, then you have your noise, and the even part of the noise um, it also adds up. So you have two R1 and two R2 over here, and then it's just two of R1 plus R2. And then your messages add up, right? So M1 and M2, uh, basically you have M1 plus M2 over here. Um, and note that this is addition mod two, right? So if your message here is one and your message here is one, then this is two, but the two over here is indistinguishable from just being part of the noise. And so it just becomes the same as zero. But if we just want to do binary circuits, then this is totally fine, right? So you can add together two ciphertexts and you get a ciphertext that is of the correct format of the addition or rather of the XOR of the message bits. Now, why is this multiplicatively homomorphic? So let's say you multiply together your two ciphertexts. Then you have an expression of the form that your first ciphertext, uh, K1P plus 2R1 plus M1, multiplied by your second ciphertext, K2P plus 2R2 plus uh, M2. And you basically just kind of fully expand this. And when we expand it, we're just going to say, look, first of all, let's figure out which terms are multiples of P, right? Because if you remember the decryption process, the decryption process starts off by just uh, modding, which just kills all your multiples of P. So let's figure out what the multiples of P are because we don't have to care about them. Basically, you have uh, K, um, K1P multiplied by all three of these. Then you have K2P multiplied by all three of these. So these five terms go over here. Now you have two times uh, 
So now we have to figure out which of the remaining terms that are not multiples of p are even. And it's basically 2r1 multiplied by this. And you have 2r2 multiplied by this. So we have a bunch of terms that get multiplied by 2. And then you have this thing over here, which is not multiplied by p and not multiplied by 2, which is just the product of the messages. Right? So if you take this expression, and then you do a mod p, and then you do a mod 2, then the mod p is going to kill these five terms. The mod 2 is going to kill these three terms. And so you just have uh, this one term left. So we, sh we see that this is additively homomorphic. We see that this is multiplicatively um, homomorphic. Uh, now, why is it uh, have uh, kind of any level of security? Basically, it's this approximate GCD problem, right? Basically, if you did not have noise, uh, so if we did not have uh, this uh, kind of two times small random, then you have just a bunch of multiples of p plus 0 or 1, and then a bunch of them are going to be just multiples of p plus 0, then you can just uh, use um, any uh, G a GCD algorithm, and then you just keep a, a, a just the Euclidean algorithm, and you just uh, GCD all of these multiples together, and you get p, and then you can uh, kind of break the scheme, right? But as it turns out, um, if you just have approximate multiples, then figuring out what p is becomes much harder, right? So the security of this cryptographic scheme is based on the kind of the, the hardness of computing approximate GCDs as opposed to computing uh, kind of exact GCDs, which is easy. So there is a more general principle here, which is basically that solving systems of equations becomes much more difficult when these equations have errors or you can, or you can call them noise, right? So if you add some noise into your equations, then suddenly figuring out uh, kind of parameters that are par parts of those equations that you can normally figure out easily, it just suddenly becomes much harder. And this is pretty much what um, kind of the security of all of these constructions ends up being based on. So as a side note, public key encryption. So I showed um, this scheme as being a secret key scheme, right? You need P to encrypt. Now, turning these schemes into public key schemes is really easy, right? You basically just provide a bunch of encryptions of zero, and then if you can public key encrypt zero by just computing a random linear combination of these, and you can add some more error. And um, if you want to encrypt one, then <coughs> you could just take these encryptions of zero and add one. If you want something more generic, then into your public key, you can add some encryptions of one, and then to encrypt one, you add a bunch of encryptions of zero, and then an odd number of encryptions of one and you have a, a, a new encryption of one, right? So turning any fully or, or kind of homomorphic scheme that is private key, you can turn it into a public key one pretty easily. That's not a problem. Now, why doesn't this uh, work already, right? So there's two problems. One of them is that multiplication uh, just doubles uh, the length of the ciphertext, right? So here you had a K1P um, and, and K2P, and here you have K1, K2P. And um, actually, it's K1, K2P times P, so it's K1, K2P squared. And so the bit length of uh, this multiplication is just going to be the sum of the bit lengths of the um, ciphertexts um, that are coming in. And so if you try to do more than a couple of multiplications, it just blows up horribly, and it, be and it just becomes impractical. right? So you can't do more than a yeah, logarithmic number of multiplications, period. But there is another problem, which is overflow of the errors. Right? So if you remember, the sum of the ciphertexts uh, kind of turns into a new ciphertext of this format, then the product of the ciphertext turns into a new ciphertext of this format. We can look at what happens to the even uh, kind of error term here. Right? When you add, the error roughly doubles. You take the sum of the errors. When you multiply, the error squares. Right? So over, when you had R1 and R2, here you have a 2R1, R2. And so the bit length of the error doubles. And so once again, the maximum a multiplicative depth is going to be the logarithm of the number of bits in P, so, or the log of log of P. Right? So you can think of the maximum multiplicative depth as being really low. Like Think of it as being something like, like 10 or even 5. Like it's, it's tiny. So how do we overcome this uh, overflow problem? So there's two general categories of uh, solutions to this, right? The first category of solutions basically is that we do clever tricks to make multiplying only increase the error by a constant factor. 
And so instead of having log log p or log of the number of bits of p in multiplicative depth, you just you actually do have a log p multiplicative depth. So the multiplicative depth is proportional to the number of bits in p, right? So if you imagine we can make a protocol where every multiplication increases the error by some fixed factor, say a factor of a thousand, then that's only ten bits. And so if your p has or if your modulus has a yeah, bit length of uh, say ten thousand, then your multiplicative depth goes up to one thousand, which is already huge. Now, so this is one solution. And the second kind of solution is bootstrapping, right? So bootstrapping basically is this kind of key switching uh, mechanism where what we're going to do is basically imagine that you have um, some uh, ciphertext that has some noise and you want to convert it into a fresh ciphertext that has less noise, right? So what, we're, what we'll do is we will basically take the uh, kind of circuit for that represents uh, decrypting x under some secret key and we're going to evaluate it homomorphically right so what we're going to do is we're going to take um, x so x is a ciphertext then we're going to represent x as a bunch of bits and what you're going to do is we're going to uh, provide a kind of bootstrapping key so think of this as being part of the public key of the system where uh, so first of all you, uh, you can encrypt the bits of x under some new key. So you can encrypt the bits of um, x here under some new key s2. But also, we provide the bits of um, s under a key s2, right? So what this basically means is that you have, for some key s2, you have the, public, the regular public key for s2, and you also have an encryption of s under s2. And so given the value of x in the clear, you convert that into its bits then you convert that into encryptions of the bits of x, and then you have encryptions of the bits of x, you have encryptions of the bits of s, and you just compute um, fs homomorphically. Basically, you just compute, F um, compute this decryption uh, process using these inputs um, uh, that we have, and what this gives you is this, uh, the decryption process returns one bit, and so you get one bit, which is the decryption of x, so it is the same bit that x represents, except it gets encrypted under the key S2, right? So before we had a um, X, which is an encryption of some bit under S, and now we have basically an encryption of X that's under the key S2. So, and the important thing is, right, that X might've had a lot of error, but this uh, decryption, it's only going to have a fixed amount of error, regardless of how much error you have over here, right? And the reason basically is that, well, from the kind of perspective of looking this under key S2, all of these uh, bits start off as being a ciphertext of error of kind of the minimal, uh, the minimum error level. They start being kind of depth one. And then this uh, decryption has some constant depth. And so the amount of error that's uh, going to be in the result is actually going to be constant, even if there is a lot of error in the ciphertext here. So before I kind of continue, maybe I should offer an opportunity for some questions because bootstrapping is kind of a little bit complicated to, uh, uh, to understand. So maybe just kind of think for a bit and make sure that you understand what's going on here. One question I have uh, regarding bootstrapping is, is there randomness involved and where does it come from? Mm -hmm. uh, so bootstrapping just basically means that you're evaluating the decryption circuit. So the place where there is a kind of error involved is basically that the process of um, homomorphically encrypting uh, the, these um, X bits um, is gonna involve uh, basically taking values from the, from the public key and those values already have some noise inside of them. So the process of executing the circuit kind of after you have those values doesn't require you to have in um, um, to add any extra randomness but the bootstrapping key already has a kind of randomness that, that got used in the process of constructing it right that makes sense could, could you describe what what exactly sorry i'm having what's the what's the output of the decryption function what does that oh. look like when it's evaluated in the circuit right so the output of the decryption function is either the bit 0 or the bit 1 depending on what the ciphertext x represents 
Right, but okay. So I'm the the thing I'm, I'm having trouble with is that mm -hmm. I don't want the one evaluating the circuit to actually see those bits, right? Correct. Uh, so so I don't okay. Want so them the to reason why you um, the person evaluating the circuit cannot see those bits is because that person does not have X, right? So computing the decryption requires you to have X and it requires you to have X. Now in your bootstrapping key, you're not gonna give them X. You're gonna give them an encryption of the bits of S under S2. And so the only thing they can do is they can evaluate the decryption circuit in a way that gives them just output, um, outputs that are encrypted under the key S2. They have no way of uh, kind of extracting um, outputs in the clear. I see. So DAC, they don't actually get DAC, they get the decryption circuit. Okay, they have some representation of it. Mm -hmm. They get the bits of S encrypted using S2. Mm -hmm. And they and run the circuit right. they using run, those bits. Exactly. So they, uh, they have S encrypted under S2. They, uh, they have X in the clear. And so they just encrypt X under S2. And then DAC is, a pub, is, is just a circuit and it's part of the algorithm, so everyone has it, and so you just evaluate DEC homomorphically using bits encrypted under S2, and so you get zero or one encrypted under S2. Right, so what you write below this ENC DEC, that's not actually something I have to do. I ha only Correct. have to run the DEC, and that automatically Correct. already gives me the encryption. Okay. Exactly, so this, this is just what it's equivalent to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, it so what it what is K? Um, uh, K, okay, is just uh, whatever val whatever the value is that's uh, that Z is encrypting. Oh, I see. Okay. Why, it, once you've re-encrypted this, why can't you back propagate the new um, lower entropy or, or the, the, the new re-encrypted format with the lower error? Why can't you back propagate that lower error? And gain a log factor or constant to give you your multiplication trick through every previous multiplication again. How would you back propagate the lower error? I, 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 I don't know. I haven't tried to play with this yet, but right, so intuitively it, it, it feels like there may be some method of doing that. No, I, I think the, the problem is right that it, like lower error plus higher error equals higher error, and generally, kind of any function that. Like if you have some function and you throw in a lower thing and a higher thing, you get a higher thing out. So like because the errors are just randomly generated, you're not going to be able to make them cancel in some way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so one subtle technical point. Um, so this is encrypt this X is um, encrypted under S, and here we're saying we encrypted it under S2. Technically, you could just set S equal S equals S2, right? So you could technically just um, have um, encrypt the bits of X under S, and then you can have the bootstrapping key be the bits of S encrypted under S. And this um, makes things a lot easier because instead of having lots of keys um, you, or having a, like an entire chain of keys with a chain of bootstrapping keys, you can just have one key. So why like in the standard descriptions of bootstrapping don't people do that? Basically, for, for weird technical reasons, you can't prove a kind of a security reduction straight to the lattice, um, to the lattice assumptions. Um, and so there's this kind of special term, it's called circular security. Um, and depending on how, whether or not you're one of these cryptographers who is um, like, no, you have to have proofs versus one of these cryptographers who's like, yeah, whatever, it's fine, dog. Like, it's your choice whether or not to trust circular security. A lot of people think it's fine. I have a question. Uh, this S2 is also uh, a public key, so the private key don't know to Correct. just have to use several public keys of the recipient for this purpose. Mm -hmm. Right. What is the circuit depth of uh, the decryption? Good question, and I'm about to get to it in, in the um, in the next slide. Uh, so. The main problem is that the multiplicative circuit depth of uh, this decryption, it involves a modular reduction and X mod P has a, a circuit depth of log log X, which is bigger than log log P. And this is higher than what um, FHE can support, right? So basically 
un one of the pr one of the reasons why like nobody cares about the scheme that I just uh, spent uh, ten minutes describing to you is because bootstrapping is not possible. So we're going to, in general, bootstrapping has a circuit depth which is um, which is logarithmic, and so the next the next parts of uh, all of this are going to be kind of how do you make it, um, how do you adjust the scheme so that you actually can bootstrap. So we're going to skip over a few things. Uh, so Craig Gentry came up with some really clever tricks in 2009 involving subset sums and other things I don't understand um, to try to kind of get around this problem. Uh, so to try to reduce the uh, circuit depth of bootstrapping to the point where you actually can uh, bootstrap in a fairly simple um, FHE schemes. And Craig Gentry is great and we love Craig Gentry, but um, and he's going to come back in the in the story. He is the one that created, uh, or one of the people who created the matrix FHE protocol. But we're going to go straight to uh, Zvika Berkirsky and Vinod uh, Vikrantanathan's uh, work in 2011, we, which is kind of the first uh, scheme that really uh, kind of managed to get around this problem, right? So the um, Schemes that I'm going to show out um, from here on, they uh, don't depend on approximate GCD. They depend on a slightly different but kind of similar seeming assumption, which is um, this uh, learning with errors assumption, right? And the learning of errors assumption basically says that if you have a system of equations, um, so the, uh, if you have this kind of system of equations, you have a bunch of variables, you have a bunch of equations, normally you can solve them using uh, Gaussian elimination and it's fairly easy, but if you just have approximate equations, so you have a, a whole bunch of equations that even if the system is really overspecified um, that have a, a small additive error, then finding uh, any of the variables is, becomes very hard, right? So solving systems of linear equations where the outputs um, have errors in them is something which is hard, and is something which, it, which, as far as we know, is quantum hard. Um, so this all, these uh, mechanisms also reduce to um, hardness of lattices and the shortest vector problem and, and um, all of these other kind of problems that are fairly uh, well studied in mathematics. So basically the schemes that I'm going to get into um, from here on, they're not going to depend on approximate GCDs, they're going to depend on hardness of solving approximate systems of linear equations. Um, so let's get to BV 2011. And so the, the key is going to be a vector. Um, so it's, and it's going to be a vector of numbers, um, S1, S2 to Sn. And the ciphertext is going to be a vector A um, that satisfies the property that A dot product S um, is a message plus an even error. And this is all going to be done modulo some odd Q. Q doesn't have to be prime, but it, ha it has to be odd. So basically, what you, you generate an A such that A1S1 plus A2S2 plus dot dot, dot ANSM equals M plus, uh, plus two times your error. Uh, so the connection uh, between this and the learning with errors problem is basically that you can think of each of these ciphertexts as being an equation in your secret key, right? Your secret key is like S1, S2, S3, S4. The, the coefficients in the equation are going to be the A, um, and the output is going to be basically <coughs> some small number, and it's zero or one depending on what your message is, plus some error, and that error basically kind of perturbs the values, and that makes uh, it hard to extract S. So your ciphertext is just uh, and it, if you're kind of comfortable thinking in terms of vectors and dot products, it's just um, A such that A dot product S equals a message plus two times an error, or you can think of it as this linear equation. Um, one optimization is that you can set the first uh, number in your uh, secret uh, key to one, and that just makes it very easy to construct uh, these A's. Basically, you just generate um, every, all your other A's randomly, and then you set your S A one to kind of compensate for um, whatever the rest of the dot product gives. And so whatever the rest dot product gives, you basically, you construct A1 to be kind of the, the minus of that, and then the minus of that plus S1 kind of adds up together with this, and then you get um, your 
your zero, and if you set a one to be to kind of subtract another m plus two e, then or rather add another m plus two e, then this whole dot product just becomes m plus two e, right? So constructing vectors that um, satisfy this equation is very easy. So as I mentioned, an alternative um, interpretation of this vector interpretation is that a ciphertext is a noisy equation where the variables are your secret key. Addition is easy, right? So addition, uh, basically, if you have al such that al dot s equals one m plus two e, then ar such that ar dot s equals another m plus two e, then uh, dot products are additive. And so al plus ar dot s is just going to be the sum of uh, your messages plus uh, the sum of your errors. Um, and the way that you decrypt, um, obviously, is just you actually compute a dot s and you take the last bit. And so you can decrypt uh, the cipher, uh, the addition. And if you decrypt the, the addition, you get twice the even error. And then you have the kind of uh, the sum, or rather the XOR of your two messages again. Right? So addition here is simple. Multiplication is harder. Right? So the problem here is that in the scheme I showed you before, you're just operating with single numbers. And single numbers can be added and multiplied. Here, you're operating over vectors. And vectors can't just be multiplied with each other. Well, they kind of can, right? So you have this kind of notion of an exterior product, right? So basically, you have um, kind of this concept of an exterior product where a vector multiplied by another vector is just a big vector that contains all of the products of the elements, right? So if you imagine AL is a, at a vector with 10 elements, AR is a vector of 10 elements, the exterior product is going to be this vector of 100 elements that's like the first times the first, plus the first times the second, plus the first times the third, all the way up to the first times the 10th. Then you have the second uh, times the first, all the way blah, 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 and then uh, the 10th times the 10th. Now, you have this uh, nice uh, kind of algebraic identity that basically says AL exterior product AR dot producted with S exterior product S equals this dot product multiplied by this dot product, right? And so remember that AL is one ciphertext, AR is one ciphertext, and the, way, the product of the decryptions, so M1 times M2 is just going to be this dot product times this dot product. And so because of this um, algebraic identity, that equals the same thing as um, AL exterior product AR dot producted with um, S exterior product S. So if you take two ciphertexts and you just exterior product them, so basically you just turn them into this big vector that contains all of their, uh, the product, the, all possible products of uh, their elements, then that becomes a valid ciphertext of M1 times M2 under the key S times S, right? So you can multiply, but the length of your secret key grows uh, quadratically. And so the challenge is you need to have a way of going back to linear. So to go back to linear, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to have this uh, procedure that we call a relinearization, right? So the procedure for relinearization, it feels a bit like bootstrapping, like basically because what you do is you have kind of encryptions of S under your new key, and then you just evaluate things under your new key. Um, so it's kind of similar to that, but it's doing something slightly different, right? So relinearization does not um, solve the error problem. It just solves the problem of uh, taking a ciphertext under the key S times S or S exterior product S and turning it into an encryption under S. So the relinearization key is going to contain a kind of encryptions of um, SI, SJ uh, times um, 2 to the D. So it's going to contain basically SISJ for all I and J, so all elements of um, S exterior product S. And not just those elements, it's also going to contain those elements times 2, those elements times 4, those elements times 8, and so on and so forth going up, pretty much all the way up until the for every power of D that's smaller than your modulus. And so what this lets us do is it lets us compute um, an encryption of uh, the dot product of um, AL exterior product AR with S exterior product S as a linear combination of SISJ2 to the D. Right? So if you imagine this expression, like just as we did in bootstrapping, we're not going to kind of evaluate it in a clear because 
well, you don't want uh, the uh, the person executing the the circuit to be able to figure out the output and the clear. So instead, we're going to evaluate it homomorphically under either some new key, or if you're willing to assume circular security, you can provide it under S if these encryptions are under S, right? So we're going to evaluate this whole thing homomorphically just as a linear combination of all these powers, right? So for example, if you have AL as a kind of one, two, and then AR as three, four, and so AL exterior AR is going to be three, four, six, eight, right? So this is one times three, four is one times four, six is two times three, eight is two times four, then to evaluate AL exterior, the dot product of AL exterior AR with S exterior X, basically what you're going to do is you're going to say, well, you're going to have three um, multiplied by um, S1, S1, four multiplied by S1, S2, six multiplied by S2, S1, and then eight multiplied by S2, S2. And then to avoid having to multiply ciphertext, because multiplying ciphertext like, makes the error blow up, you have these powers of two. And so the multiplication you can just express as a linear combination of these powers, right? So to express um, three times um, S1, S1, you're going to take this encryption of S1, S1 times two to the zero, plus uh, the encryption of S1, S1 times two to the one. And so this gives us S1, S1 times uh, three encrypted under your new key. Then for four, you just have um, S1, S. So here, four is the second element in AL exterior ER. And so we're going to mul multiply it with the second element of S exterior X, which is um, S1, S2. So we'll use um, the encryption of S1, S2 times two squared. Then for six, um, once six is uh, two to the one plus two to the two. And so we're going to add the encryption of S2, S1 times two to the one with the encryption of S2, S1 times 2 to the 2. And then here, we're going to add the encryption of S2, S2 times 2 to the 3. And so you basically, if you add all these encryptions, then you have a vector which um, is the encryption of, um, or rather a vector which kind of, if you were to dot product it with your key, it would give you S1, S1 to the 0, plus S1, S1 to the 1, plus blah, 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 um, plus some error, because each of these terms are going to have some error added to them. And so you're going to just, we're going to add all of the, all of this error, and you have um, these set of terms, and this is going to give you three times s one s one, four times s one s two, six times s two s one, eight times s two s two, which is the same thing as this uh, um, as this term here, right? So basically, what we've done is we've um, created this uh, kind of this sum of a bunch of these ciphertexts such that if you were to decrypt it, so if you were to dot product it with the new key, then you would actually get um, a value which equals to um, the evaluation of this um, plus some more error. And so if you, if you were to evaluate it and you were to cancel the error out, then because this gives you um, M1, M2 plus some error, M1, M2 plus some error plus some error cancel out the error, you would get M1, M2. So this both kind of preserves the message, and because it's an addition of a bunch of linear size ciphertexts, the ciphertext size and the key size also go back to linear. So I'll stop again and I'll kind of wait for questions because uh, real linearization is also not very intuitive. Wow, this is super cool. Um, one of the question I have is, um, you, you mentioned that this helps reducing the size of the key, but not helping with the error. Correct. It, why does um, it not help with the error? Um, it does not help with uh, the error, basically, because this expression itself, right, it's going to evaluate to um, this multiplied by this. Um, and AL is equal to um, M plus 2E, AR is equal to M plus 2E. And so um, the, the product of those things is going to contain a term that has 4E squared. Um, and so this thing evaluates to 4E squared. And so this thing evaluates to 4E squared. And so here you have 4E squared plus um, some more error that comes from a logarithmic number of these, right? So the error still blows up from being uh, a multiple of E to being a multiple of E squared. Mm -hmm. 
Now, there is another magic trick to, uh, to make the air blow up uh, less, uh, less quickly, and I'll get, uh, I'll get to this after. But first, um, um, I'll kind of wait for questions about this scheme. What does it mean to encrypt SISJ to the D if we the, yes, about the, encryption? So this is, yes, very good question. I was about to actually answer this myself. So the, in, the kind of the encryption scheme as I provided, uh, yeah, right, it, it can only encrypt zero and one because it has some even error, right? And so you might ask, well, what does it mean to encrypt this thing, which is obviously going to be much bigger than zero and one? And so the answer basically is that that the kind of the encryption in quotes of SISJ2 to the D is going to be a, a vector A such that if you were to dot product it with the key, you would get SISJ times 2 to the D plus some even error, right? So you, can, you cannot actually extract um, SISJ2 to the D from the ciphertext because there is the error and the error is just going to kind of wash away everything except for well, it's going to wash away everything except for the really high bits and the low bit, but it's going to wash away some bits in the middle. But so it does base, it is basically a vector where if you dot product that vector with uh, the key that you get um, SISJ to the D plus even error. And so the reason why this is still useful is because if you um, add up these ciphertexts, then you still get um, a, w AL times AR, um, or AL exterior ER dot producted with S exterior X plus a whole bunch of even errors. But these even errors just kind of add together with the even errors that were already inside of here. And so whoever ends up kind of ultimately decrypting this ciphertext would still, like the errors are all even and so they will be able to just cancel, uh, take them out. Okay, I got it. So it's just kind of not encryption, probably like parts of the final ciphertext that mm -hmm. you cleverly adopt. Right. Okay. So here is um, the magic trick to make your error blow up less quickly. So first, a uh, kind of a fun fact, right? So we can switch ciphertexts between kind of what you can think of as being two perspectives, right? So one perspective is, your ciphertext is A and A dot product at S equals M plus two E where M is either zero or one. Now, if you just kind of modular divide A by two, right? So this is all mod Q, then A, A divided by uh, modular divided by two dot producted with S gives you um, M becomes M over two and two E becomes E, right? And so your even error, your small even error becomes a small error that doesn't have to be even. And m over two, so zero divided by two is zero, and one divided by two is a um, ceiling of two of um, half your modulus, right? So, if your modulus is say 999, then one divided by two is going to be 500, right? Because 500 times two is a thousand, which modulo 999 reduces to one. And so, you can basically take a ciphertext that's of this form, and then you divide your a by two. And then you convert it into a ciphertext that has this format where instead of your message being in the lowest bit, your message becomes kind of in the high order bits. Now, this perspective is better for multiplication because if your message is in low order bits, then when you multiply your two messages together, your message is, uh, kind of is still kind of preserved, right? Your message is in the kind of the field of two elements, or and I guess you can't divide, so the ring of two elements might be a little more precise. Right, like basically, if your message is in the low order bits, then everything that happens with the error kind of happens on top of the message, and the message just kind of flies under and it, do and it doesn't get affected. But in this perspective, the message is at the top, and so everything interferes with it. So in this perspective, you can't multiply. But this perspective has a key advantage, which is that it makes the noise less structured, right? So here, the noise has to be even. Here, the message just becomes small. And so by cleverly switching between these perspectives, you can, without having the secret key, change the modulus of a ciphertext. So here's what we do, right? We start off with A um, such that A dot product S equals um, your zero or one plus two times the error. Then you do a perspective switch. And so you have an A prime, which is A modular divided by two. 
which is equal to small error plus either zero or half your modulus. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to switch it from mod Q to mod P, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the, this ciphertext, we're going to take the A prime, and we're going to multiply it by P, and then we're going to integer divided by Q. Um, and so if you do this, then what you're going to get is you're going to get a value which, if you then multiply it by S, uh, so you do rescale A, but you do not rescale S, right? So this is a bit kind of important. So if you res the rescaled A prime gives you basically, well, if you, if you dot product it with the same thing, then the output is going to be rescaled. And so zero, be zero becomes zero, uh, ceiling of Q over two becomes um, roughly ceiling of P over two, small error becomes uh, small error, except the error itself also gets kind of downscaled, right? So it gets downscaled from being um, something times Q, some small, small fraction times Q to being the same small fraction times P. And so the actual magnitude of the error kind of goes down. And then when you, you basically do a reverse perspective switch, and so you go from this perspective where it's either zero or ceiling of P over two, to this perspective, you double all this, and then it becomes um, either zero or one plus uh, two times the error. Now, this oh, operation. Uh, all right. I didn't so, understand the previous step about. Okay. Yes. Why? Why? Why is the? Uh huh. Why this uh, times p uh, divided by q trick uh, works? Um, yeah. Why? Why? Why it gives you the one on the right? Why is? Why is the message now? Okay. Zero p over two. That's not obvious. Right. Um, basically, so if you just um, think of this as being just a multiplication, then if um, it if it was an encryption of zero then it's just going to give you a multiple of Q. Um, and if it was an encryption of one, then this gives you a multiple of Q plus half of Q, right? And so if you multiply this by P over Q, then multiples of Q turn into multiples of P and multiples of uh, kind of half multiples of Q turn into uh, half multiples of P. Uh, so I guess so like one example is that if you imagine say Q is 5,000 and P is 1,000, then if a prime dot s is, uh, or let's say q is 10,000, p is 1,000, just for simplicity. Then if a prime dot s here was say 50,000, or let's say 50,000 plus a bit of an error, then if you go down from, uh, go down from q to multiply by p over q, so you basically p is 1,000, q is 10,000, so you divide it by 10, so your 50,000 just becomes, uh, becomes 5,000, and 5,000 modulo 1,000 is still a zero. But if you instead had, say, 55,000, then 55,000 uh, times P over Q is going to be 5,500. And so modulo 1,000 uh, is, uh, is going to be 500. Um, and the error that gets introduced by kind of the floor division not being perfect is, is, is still a small error. So it just kind of mixes together with the small error that already exists. So this should really say E prime as opposed to E, right? It's a different uh, Correct. Topic. Yes, sorry, that's, that, that's correct. This should be E prime. And even the, con the contribution from, from E, um, mm -hmm. that's also gonna change. Um, Not right, so uh, and I'll give, I'll, to just kind of go back to this example, right? So let's say your um, A prime dot S was, uh, like as an as an integer dot product equal to, let's say instead of fifty five thousand, it was equal to fifty five thousand and thirty. So your error is thirty. Then if you multiply by p over q, fifty five thousand and thirty turns into five thousand five hundred and three. Um, and so modulo one thousand, it's going to be five hundred and three. Five hundred is p over two, and so your new error instead of, it was thirty before, now your new error is three. So basically the ratio between the error and uh, the model size remains the same. Correct. Um, and I'll, exp uh, I mean, I'll explain why, the, like, it seems like you're not accomplishing anything because the error ratio is the same, but you're actually accomplishing something really important, which I'll get into in the next slide. So I guess, so right now, right, uh, I guess, are people satisfied that 
if you have a ciphertext whose error gets bigger, you can turn it into a ciphertext whose error as a number is bounded by some constant, but it's just the modulus that keeps, that, that keeps being reduced, right? So this is kind of the lesson here. Yeah. Okay. So here is um, what, um, why um, we um, switch, right? So there's two reasons to switch, actually. So the first reason to switch is this makes bootstrapping um, actually practical, right? So bootstrapping involves basically computing this dot product a dot s mod q, and computing this dot product a dot s mod q has a, a depth, a circuit depth of log log q, and by reducing the modulus, what we can do is we can basically turn something which uh, to a decrypt requires a circuit depth of log log q to something that has a circuit depth of log log p. And p here is, is like a, can be very small, right? You're, once you do the modulus switch, you don't have to actually do any more computation, so p can be a pretty small constant. And so this basically means that the circuit depth of bootstrapping becomes a constant. And so you can just increase q to as much as you need in order to make the bootstrapping procedure, uh, procedure actually possible. Cool. Yeah. Um, so in the bootstrapping key, basically the way that we do it, so bootstrapping is just kind of computing this dot product mod p or a kind of as a circuit. And so to make this um, computable, you basically just, you're gonna provide um, si times two to the d values in binary representation. Right, so for every SI times two to the D, you, well, you basically, and, and this is modulo uh, P, uh, then you, pr you provide a binary representation of this, and so you have um, N, uh, log, N log P numbers in binary representation. So for every one of these terms, um, you have your um, SN, basically to compute AN, um, SN you take uh, for, every kind, for every one bit that's in AN, because you have AN in the clear, um, you multiply that by the corresponding kind of bit representation of, uh, kind of the power of SN. And so you just have a bunch of these uh, numbers. Um, and these are numbers in binary representation, right? So they're not single ciphertext, they're, they're log P ciphertexts. And then you just add a whole bunch of these numbers together. Um, and then you, to take modulo, um, if you, like the, the best choice of P is gonna be two to the power of N minus one. And that makes modulo really easy because you, just meet your addition circuits wrap around. So how do we implement, uh, right? So how do we implement uh, these addition circuits, right? So basically, so the, addi the addition circuit is just going to be, a, you have these n log p numbers and you just have to add together these n log p numbers, right? And then the modulo, basically your addition circuits, instead of uh, kind of, instead of carrying, um, uh, uh, onto kind of even higher bits, like every time you carry past the size of P, you just kind of wrap around, right? And then that just gives you modulo a 2n minus one for free, right? So like if your modulus is 1,023, then your bits are you know, 128, 256, 512, then 1,024 is equal to one. So you just kind of wrap that around to one. So moduloing is really easy. So your, your setting is you just have to add together a whole bunch of numbers, right? And the first step is that you can reduce three numbers to two numbers. So you can have a kind of three to two adder that has multiplicative depth one, right? So, and the way that this works is basically that you t every bit of P um, is going to be just the XOR of um, the corresponding bits of A and B and C. Um, and every bit of Q is going to be kind of the two of three functions of A and B and C, right? So this is zero if A plus B plus C is zero or one, and one if A plus B plus C is two or three. And you can think of this as being carry digits, right? And the Q, you also kind of multiply it by two, which basically means you just kind of left shift Q by one, right? So the reason why this works is basically because every bit um, in um, A and B and C um, it gets, uh, uh, gets represented inside of P, uh, but then in the specific case where um, you have uh, kind of two bits um, or, that are turned on to one, then inside of P they get turned into zero, but um, based, 
but you get you flip the corresponding q from a zero to a one, and then the q gets uh, kind of moved to the left by one, and, and so that multiplies it by two, and so basically, kind of every individual bit in a, b, or c gets uh, kind of correctly represented in p plus q, right? So this is a kind of three to two adder, um, and this has multiplicative depth one. Um, adding two numbers x plus y does require logarithmic multiplicative depth, right? So when you go, so if you going from n numbers to two numbers, that requires the multiplicative depth, which is basically logarithmic in um, n. Uh, so logarithmic in the number of uh, the number of numbers, and we don't care about the size. But then adding the last two does require multiplicative depth to log log x plus y. And here x and y are mod p, so we're basically saying log log p or log of uh, the number of log of the number of digits of p. Right, so if p is 1,023, then p has 10 digits. The log of 10 is going to be, well, 4. Um, and so your multiplicative depth is just going to be 4. Now, the reason why adding circuits have um, this non logarithmic multiplicative depth is basically because you have to worry about kind of threading the carry bits through the number. And I mean, in the code that, I, that I'll link to later, I have algorithms for doing this. So in general, taking computing a linear combination of size n log p is going to take size. Um, so first of all, you have these n numbers. Um, and second, you have this kind of log, um, the, and the n numbers together, they're gonna, the, the sum is going to be a size n log p. And so it's kind of log of n log p. And so this becomes a log of log n plus log log p. Here you have another log log p. And so the total kind of O is going to be a kind of log n plus log log p. And you can pretty easily just set q to be high enough that this is less than log log q. And so you can basically you can de implement the decryption circuit and so you can bootstrap. So here's optimization number two, right? So I mentioned um, back when we were over here, right, that there's two, two tricks to overcome overflow where one is bootstrapping and the other is uh, clever tricks to make your, multipli your multiplication only increase your error by a constant factor. So this is the uh, clever tricks that, that I'm going to talk about. Right? So basically, imagine if instead of just doing a modular switch be before bootstrapping, we do a modular switch after every multiplication. Right? So if you don't do this, right? so if you imagine um, a circuit that has some multiplicative depth, then your error is going to square um, every time you do a multiplication, right? So if you imagine your first ciphertext, let's say the module says 10 to the 16 minus 1, and your ciphertext has error 10 squared. If you square it, the error is going to be 10, 10 to the 4. Actually, it'll be a 10 to the 4 times, times some constant, but we'll simplify and we'll say it's 10 to the 4. Then the third time you multiply, the error is 10 to the 8. Then the fourth time you multiply, the error is 10 to the 16, and then the error kind of overwhelms the ciphertext, and then here decryption starts failing. So if you just do uh, this uh, kind of fully homomorphic um, or just ho partially homomorphic encryption naively, then after a logarithmic multiplication depth, you're screwed. Now, what happens if you do modulus reduction, right? So you have x, which has an error of 10 squared, modulo 10 to the 16 minus 1. Then you, multi you, you multiply it, and so you have x squared with an error of 10 to the 4. Now you perform a reduction. And so you, here you have x um, error 10 to the 4 modulus 10 to the 16 minus 1. We're going to basically cut the modulus by a factor of 100. And so your error gets cut from 10 to the 4 to 10 squared, and your modulus gets cut from 10 to the 16 to 10 to the 14. And so now you have this term over here. And then you can, uh, or well, over here, be, or you have this term over here. Now, if you square this again, right, then your x squared goes up to x to the 4. Your error of 10 squared goes back up to being an error of 10 to the 4. Your modulus is the same. Then you reduce it again. And now your error goes down to 10 squared. Your modulus kind of hops down again. Then you square it again. The error goes up from 10 squared to 10 to the 4. And then you just reduce the modulus again. And so notice that instead of the error squaring every time, basically we have the modulus just kind of very nicely, orderly, just stepping down by a constant factor every time, right? So the, the clever trick here is basically that when you multiply the ciphertexts, the errors get multiplied. And so if you just make sure that the errors as numbers uh, stay small, then 
squaring the error uh, is always just going to be a constant factor multiplication. And so instead of having a logarithmic number of steps, you can have a linear number of steps. And so your multiplicative depth goes up from log log q to uh, log q. Um, pause for questions again. I didn't completely follow everything. So it's okay. multiplicative depth of what? Don't we want to decrease the multiplicative depth? Oh, sorry. By multiplicative depth, I mean the maximum multiplicative depth that you can support, right? So oh, right. Uh, if you notice, like the example at the top and the example at the bottom, um, here uh, you be, your error blows up to the point where it overwhelms the modulus um, after three multiplications, right? Because yes. each time you're squaring. Here, we're keeping the error under control, right? The error is just always 10 to the 4 down to 10 squared, up to 10 to the 4, down to 10 squared, up to 10 to the 4, down to 10 squared, except every time the modulus just steps down by a constant factor of 10 squared. And so here, instead of doing three steps, you can do eight steps, right? So here, you can do log log two steps. Here, you can do log two steps. And both optimizations are kind of unlocked by this context switch. Idea. Right. Right. So both the bootstrapping and um, this technique that lets you basically not need bootstrapping half the time are unlocked by the module switch. Cool. OK. So now we move on to um, what this presentation was supposed to be about, which is matrix FHE. Um, so the problem that matrix FHE solves is basically can we try to find something that's kind of more natural and more efficient than relinearization, right? So relinearization is expensive, basically because relinearization requires you to just add this really huge number of ciphertexts. And if you imagine a large modulus, you're talking about hundreds of ciphertexts for each element. So can we try to make something that's kind of somewhat nicer? And can we also try to create a protocol that's somewhat simpler where adding and multiplying ciphertexts actually is done by adding and multiplying elements in some kind of naturally, naturally reasonable ring. Uh, so matrices, yay. Um, so here is kind of the context, right? So to encrypt S with, or to encrypt zero with a secret key, what we're going to do is we're going to have um, come up with a matrix A such that the secret key multiplied by the matrix is an error. Um, and to encrypt one, we're going to have um, a matrix A such that a secret key multiplied by the A gives the secret key plus an error, right? So basically what we're doing is we're kind of hiding an approximate eigenvector where here the, uh, where the eigenvalue, if it's zero, the eigenvalue is zero. And if it's one, the eigenvalue is one. And if you really want, you can potentially encrypt other values as long as the eigenvalue, and the eigenvalue kind of becomes the place where the uh, plain text gets hidden. And it's only an approximate eigenvalue, and so you can't extract it using kind of the standard techniques for the standard uh, because learning with errors makes it hard. So addition is easy, right? Basically, addition, um, if you just add together two matrices, then so if you add together a matrix such that SA equals something with a matrix where SA equals something else, then um, S of AL plus AR is just going to be um, basically whatever the value uh, is for the first one plus whatever the value is for the second one, right? So S times AL, S times, um, AL or decrypt of AL plus AR becomes decrypt of AL plus decrypt of AR, which is going to be um, your left message times S plus uh, your left error plus your right message times S plus your right error. And so you have the sum of your messages times S plus uh, the sum of the errors, right? That's basically kind of the same thing that we had before. Except here, because instead of dealing with vectors, we're dealing with matrices, and matrices, yay, can actually be multiplied, then the decryption of the multiplication of the matrices is going to be S multiplied by AL times ER. And remember, you can think of matrices as being linear maps. And so you're going to kind of pass S through AL, and then you're going to pass S through AR. And so the eigenvalues get kind of get producted as well. And, and so you can kind of show that this uh, kind of expands out. So you have first S passing through AL, then you multiply that by AR. Uh, and so S times AL is going to be a kind of MLS um, 
plus uh, e plus el as before, right? So here, like s times a is going to be whatever your message is multiplied by s, either one or zero, plus uh, your error. Except here, we still have to multiply it by ar. So we have mls times ar, then you have el times ar, and so here. Um, time multiplying by AR basically means your MLS is going to turn into, well, L ML MRS because um, AR, AR times S by itself is going to give you kind of MRS, right? And so if S times AR gives you MRS, then ML times S times AR is going to give you ML MRS. So here, kind of the decryption of the product is going to give you kind of the product of the messages here. And then over here, you're, you have is um, the two error terms, right? So one of the error terms is going to be the left error multiplied by AR. And then here you have the right error multiplied by AR multiplied by the left message. So you can add, you can multiply, but there is a problem, right? And the problem is that the error is not just being multiplied by um, the other error, you're not just having like EL times AR. Instead, your error gets multiplied by the magnitude of the matrix elements. So if you start with matrices that have a fairly small um, magnitude, then every time you do a multiplication, your, the magnitude of your matrix elements just keeps on doubling. And so once again, you're limited to your depth being kind of log log two. Um, by the way, just kind of one other reason why this matrix approach is nice. Um, basically, we don't, from here on, we don't actually care about the modulus as being odd. We don't care about them being prime. We don't care about modulus as having any kind of properties. And so to make the math easy, we're just going to set the modulus as to equal uh, so, uh, some power 2 to the k. And that makes some um, kind of math really easy. And it makes bootstrapping really easy as well, because you can just kind of forget the higher order bits. Um, so. The problem is, right, that you have this kind of EL multiplied by AR, and these AR values themselves are kind of get big, and they get, get bigger every time you multiply, and so how do you stop the error from just blowing up? So the fix to this problem is you, you have this kind of really strange and clever bit splitting trick. And the bit splitting trick basically says that, um, if we, if we treat x as being a vector, then we're going to define these two functions. One is called powers of 2, the other is called bitify, where powers of 2 basically says for every element in x, you just kind of concatenate the powers of 2 of x, and then bitify of x just turns it into a bit representation. Then you have this identity that the dot product of powers of 2 of x together with the uh, bitify of y equals to the dot product of x of y. And to kind of visually show this, I have an example, right? So if you have x as 1, 2, 3, and then y is 6, 5, 4, then powers of 2 of x of 1 turns into 1, 2, 4, uh, 2 times into 2 times 1, 2, 4, so 2, 4, 8, and then 3 um, turns into 3, 6, 12, and then y turns into its bit representation, so 6 is 1, 1, 0, 5 is 1, 0, 1, 4 is 1, 0, 0, and the dot product here, well, here it's 1 times 6, and then here, we're basically kind of doing powers times bit res representations. And so you have 2 times 1 and then 4 times 1. Um, so this adds up to being 6. Um, then over here, 2 times 5. And you basically, the 5 turns into 1, 0, 1. And so you add uh, 2 times 1. And then here, you add 2 times 4 times 1 to kind of compensate for this 1 having a higher place value. And so 2 times 1 plus 8 times 1 is 10, which is 2 times 5. And then 3 times 4 is 12. And so 3 times, well, here, 4, you just have like a 1 here. And then the 1 gets multiplied by 3 times 4. And so you have 12. Right? So I guess um, also pausing and just kind of stare at this and, ver and just kind of verify for yourselves that this works. Right? So basically, powers uh, kind of converting x into powers of 2 and converting y into a bit representation is a, uh, is a dot product preserving um, operation. It kind of feels a little bit like the relinearization trick. Exactly, yes. Um, it's very, uh, very similar, except this is kind of rep just explicitly representing linear relinearization using a ve vector methods. It's exactly the same sort of stuff. 
So the bit splitting technique also applies to matrices because matrix math is basically just batched vector math, right? And so powers of two of s times bit of i of a equals some um, e equals s times a. Um, actually, this should, should be a dot. This should be just um, actual matrix multiplication. And so what we're going to do is we're going to basically do, um, instead of doing al times ar, we're going to do al times bit of i of ar, right? And we're going to set um, our ciphertext, instead of being n times n, we're going to set them as being kind of n times n log p. Basically, the idea is that the, whatever is on the left side, we're going to kind of set it as being permanently in this kind of powers of two representation. And, and so bit of I is going to give us an n log p times n log p of matri matrix. And so uh, kind of the dimensions match up. But instead of multiplying al times ar, we're going to multiply al times bit of I of ar. And the reason why we do this is basically because um, if you notice here, you know, you have um, these two terms, uh, these two error terms, one has um, ERAR and one has um, ELAR. And so if AR elements are always going to be zero and one, then here you just have EL and then here you just have ER multiplied by the message, which is just going to be zero or one. And so the error blow up is small, right? The error blow up is just going to be um, adding a whole bunch of these um, uh, uh, terms that were proportional to the original error. So I'll admit it's uh, the thing that's kind of difficult to see is why AL times bit of I AR is still um, kind of is still eigenvector preserving the same way that AL times AR was um, eigenvector preserving. Um, Again, basically, the um, how do I describe this? Like the the, the idea, the, the kind of intuitive idea, right, is that the, these ALs are kind of permanently in this powers of two form, and then these ARs are permanent are going to be bitified, and so their dot product is going to be the same as it was if you just had a kind of regular AL together with just a regular AR, um, and so. There are the eigenvector here instead of, well, here it's not kind of fully an eigenvector instead of being S, instead of turning S to S, it's actually going to turn S into powers of two of S, but kind of this works and I mean, you can kind of, exp you can also just experimentally verify that it works, right? And the benefit is that, um, uh, again, as I mentioned, instead of the error blow up multiplied by big AR values, you just guarantee that these AR values are always zero and one, and so the error blow up is smaller. Right. Um, by the way, if anyone, um, I have code here. So if um, anyone want, uh, and the code is actually not long. So the homomorphic encryption here is about 300 lines of Python. This is under 200 lines of Python. So if you want to kind of see for yourself, if you want to kind of play around with matrices for yourself and, verif and uh, kind of verify things for yourself, I highly recommend looking through the code as well. Um, so optimizations, right? So there's a bunch of ways to optimize this. Um, so first of all, you might notice that one of the really interesting problems uh, or properties of matrix FHE is that the error growth is asymmetric. So here you basically, you're multiplying by, you know, by AR and you, here you have just EL, um, here you have ER being multiplied by a message. And you have this interesting property that if you have a ciphertext on the right that has a higher error, then the error actually barely increases at all. Right, and so what this basically means is that if, you know, whereas in tensor FHE you might well, like you don't really have this property, the errors kind of just multiply here. If you want to perform some uh, kind of um, operation, that it actually makes sense to perform that operation kind of asymmetrically. So, say if you want to do a bunch of additions, then you just kind of fold them all into this into the same sum one, um, one after the other. Um, the error bounds criterion becomes kind of more complicated. So it's not just max multiplicative depth. It's not just max polynomial degree. It becomes this weird complicated thing. Um, 
other optimizations um, so you can decompose, so you don't need to do things in base two, you, um, or you don't need to decompose into kind of binary and powers of two. You can also do this in base three or base four or base 16, and this uh, potentially lets uh, the error kind of increase less slowly. Um, you can pack multiple bits into a ciphertext that you can do kind of addition and multiplication on, on a lot of bits at the same time. There's also this thing called ring LWE where basically instead of just um, thinking about kind of a, a whole bunch of independent equations, you can represent those equations as being an equation in a polynomial ring. And I don't really have time to get into this, but this also lets you kind of decrease uh, key sizes a lot. So this is still kind of basically how a kind of modern fully homomorphic encryption schemes work except there's this kind of whole suite of, optimi of optimizations that people have been slowly coming up with. Uh, so the main reason why there is a big overhead is basically because the ciphertexts are matrices, right? And in order to satisfy these LWE assumptions, the ciphertexts have to have a pretty substantial length. And so you can think of these matrices as being something like 100, um, matrices of size 100 by 100 or, or whatever. And then here we're going to um, store them in powers of two and we're going to bitify them. And so the, the, the 100 potentially blows up into being 10,000 at least temporarily. And so matrix multiplication becomes this really big uh, kind of multiplication procedure. And if you want to be able to process circuits of substantial size, then these numbers have to have a fairly substantial bit length. So we're potentially talking you know, over, a, over 100 potentially. So there's a bunch of factors that do end up kind of conspiring to make it fairly diff um, uh, or to, to make this kind of fairly inherent large blow up in uh, circuit sizes. And this is the reason why this is all kind of less uh, large and, le and uh, less clean than uh, things like elliptic curve cryptography, for example. But it is kind of increasingly getting to the point where for at least small computations, uh, it is a uh, it is completely viable and you can do kind of individual computational steps on the order of milliseconds. So there you go. Thank you, that was really cool. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I have a question of what, do you know what is considered uh, the state of the art today? Like there is all these different libraries out there, TFHE and all these kind of things. So well, what is, what is what method and mm -hmm. is considered the best today? Right. There's definitely a bunch of libraries, like HELib is one of them, and there, there are some others with different names. Uh, so there was a survey um, or by uh, Zvika Burkursky, the inventor of the 2011 protocol. Um, mm -hmm. so you, let's see if I can look this up right now. Um, here you have um, fundamentals of fully homomorphic encryption. Um, and so it's um, basically just search fundamentals of fully homomorphic encryption with uh, Zvika Burkursky. And then what you get, um, it's from 2018 and it basically describes uh, kind of something similar to the Atrix FPG protocol. Uh, so the, the state of the art is definitely, you start from either the Tensor approach, or, I'm sorry, the Ethereum product approach, or the matrix approach, they have different pros and cons, and then you just apply a whole bunch of optimizations. Ring LWE is one of them. Another one is those various schemes for being able to kind of stuff a whole bunch of ciphertexts um, into this, or a whole bunch of messages into the same ciphertext. Uh, so like one of the ways that you can do this is you can imagine um, here, you know, instead of uh, having a ciphertext where A just um, satisfies A dot product that equals one message, you might say, a dot product s out of uh, message and a dot product t satisfies another message. And then you can do kind of SIMD operations. So you can, if you add and multiply, that kind of adds and multiplies all the plain text simultaneously. And then you can do kind of rotations, you can do kind uh, of permutations. Um, and so there's this uh, kind of growing uh, body of clever tricks, the same way that the zero knowledge proof space has a, a growing body of clever, clever tricks. They try to compensate for um, the uh, inherent inefficiencies. Uh, so that's where we're basically at right now. We're at kind of just taking this uh, base and uh, incrementally building upon it. Awesome, thanks.
Uh, I sent a link to the report that you referred to in the Telegram channel. Great. Uh, I just have a quick you question. You can also look up. Oh, sorry, like finish this one first. It's a no, I was just going to mention difference. that you can also you, you can also look up a BV 2011. There's also another protocol at BV 2012, which um, avoids the need to do modulo switching um, in the um, completely like basically by kind of pretending that the um, that the ciphertexts are fractional, um, but still representing them as integers. Um, so uh, you're just going to feel free to look up the papers for for all of these as well. And then you know, hopefully they'll be more understandable after this. All right, thanks. But go ahead. Um, yeah, that, this is like, just coming back to your last uh, thing about the switching into AL and AR matrices. Um, so, um, so where, where uh, yes. Okay, so you can, you can do this multiplication. So how, um, in the in the next step, right? You do it using the Spitify. Isn't that mm -hmm. actually exactly? I, I haven't quite understood why the why you're not doing exactly the same operation and just computing it in a different way. Right. Um, so basically, the um, idea here is uh, that. So Bitify is guaranteed is guaranteed to always contain zeros and ones, right? Ah, I think I I, I think I might I I might have a good intuitive answer. Uh, so the intuitive answer is so first of all, like powers of two and or kind of power of two reduction and Bitify are kind of opposites in some sense, right? So if you Bitify something, then you can multiply it by a matrix, which kind of converts it back into the pre-Bitified form, but if you take a matrix which is unbitified and multiply it by a matrix which is in this case not bit uh, not bitified, then the multiplication itself, um, when you do a kind of modulo, it's uh, going to, and then you kind of unbit if you're basically kind of what this is is and you can think of it as being kind of an unbitified version of a yeah, uh, of a bitified uh, thing, and. What happens is that the inver the kind of inverse of bitifying that's kind of inherently baked into here, it has um, this um, uh, property that if you apply it to things that are not bits, right? So a bitified matrix multiplied by another bitified matrix is not necessarily going to contain bits because matrix multiplication adds a whole bunch of bits together. Then you're still going to get a you're still going to get a matrix. And you're still because you have modular reduction, it's still going. It's going to reduce to modulo whatever your modulus is, and then so basically the modular reduction just kind of magically makes the the higher order terms go away. And because you're only doing the matrix multiplication while the matrices are bitified, means that the process of matrix multiplication never multiplies any particular value by more than the width of the matrix, and so the error only gets multiplied by a, by a small amount, right? So a, it's, it's actually not the same operation. It's um, a different operation, but which is still, but which is still guaranteed to have yeah. a kind of the same consequences, specifically with respect to multi uh, multiplying by like basically things that of the format of- uh, So of I actually just noticed that I- of two. That I don't even know what this multiplication here means because like, so in the previous operation, okay, so we have like bitify has blown up a vector right. into, okay, an n times right. log p vector, right? So what are these a, r and a, l objects here? Yes. Are they tensors or are they still two dimensional matrices? How many these are, these are all um, matrices, right? Uh, so, Right, so, so the way to intuitively think of this is, okay, so here's one way to intuitively think of this, right? So think of AL as being a bitified matrix multiplied, so, for, so AR has some size n log p times n log p, right? Bitify AR is a big square. AL has size n kind of small times big, it's n times n log p. And think of AL as being bitified AL multiplied by the matrix that is the inverse of bitification, right? So, Imagine that, like, the inverse bitify matrix multiplied by bitify AL multiplied by bitify AR. 
and then you're going to take Bitify AL and Bitify AR, then you multiply them together. And then to actually see what this means, you have your kind of inverse bitification matrix multiplied by the product of, uh, the, product of the bitifies. Mm. So, right, so basically you have these uh, kind of matrices that have, the, that have the property that if you multiply them by powers of two of s, then you get uh, powers of two of s. And so here you have kind of already washed matrices. And so if you multiply them by s, you get powers of, you get powers of two of s. Um, and then if you take AL and kind of expand it out and, um, as, a, uh, as a bitified thing, then the bitified things are kind of, they're both uh, kind of, well, powers of two of S is an eigenvector basically. And so if you product together bitify AL with bitify AR, you get something where powers of two of S is also an eigenvector. And then if you kind of squash it back, then you get, uh, you get a ciphertext that's still kind of of the same form. Right. I see, uh, yeah. I mean, I have, as I, I said, I, you know, I, uh, uh, right. I, no, I, I think, yeah, I, if he wants to kind of. Yeah, I think I, I realized the parts that I don't understand it. I guess I'll have to look at the source. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, I'd recommend like not even just looking at the source, but even just kind of opening up a Python console and kind of playing around with uh, kind of bitify and um, multiplying by vectors and just kind of see what properties um, uh, the uh, ciphertext and, uh, the, and the bitified ciphertext have with respect to multiplying by s and multiplying by powers of two of s. Uh -huh. Okay, all right. Okay, so now, okay, here's the part I didn't understand. So there's no extra operation each time. Now, the whole time we are computing with n times n log p matrices. Yes. Aha, uh -huh, I see. Okay, so we changed our protocol. This is not right. just like a modification of the multiplication itself. Right, right. Yeah. So another way to think about this, I think like this, this approach is just an optimization. Another way of thinking about this is you can make a less efficient but, but easier to understand protocol if, you, if your ciphertexts are n log p times n log p matrices. So imagine your ciphertexts are kind of bit of 5 L and bit of A, right? So they are big matrices that contain only zeros and ones that have the property that powers of two of S is an eigenvector, right? So we agree that if you just multiply AL um, times bit of five AR, then um, powers of two is going to be an, uh, or of S is going to be an eigenvector of the product, right? But then what this operation does, look, like basically we want to preserve the invariance that your ciphertexts are just zeros and ones, right? After you multiply two matrices together, they're not necessarily zeros and ones. And so what we're going to do is we're going to basically kind of do an inverse uh, bitify operation, so squash it. And because of this, um, squashing preserves the eigenvector. So basically, before it turns powers of s into powers of s, powers of two of s into powers of two of s, after it just turns s into powers of two of s, you squash it and then you bitify it again. And the squashing and the bit, and, and you kind of, you basically, the squashing and the kind of it preserves the eigenvector but it, it kind of forces the values in the ciphertext to just continue being zeros and ones. Cool, and you mentioned, um, like you can do operations in order of milliseconds. That's like sort of one one bit essentially, like a one bit operations, like something mm -hmm. like yes. and and more. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. I am. I have a question. I'm. I'm not sure. On the, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. First, thanks for a fantastic presentation. And the question is, uh, you have talked so far. Uh, only about uh, multiplications of uh, plain text mm -hmm. and cipher text, but do you think that mm -hmm. any of this technique translates to some uh, more complex functions, like polynomials of cipher text, something like more naturally than just mm -hmm. computing them uh, operation by operation? Yes, that's a 
I mean, it, it's a good question. Um, I think, um, so one of the challenges is, right, so first of all, this, um, this technique, it's theoretically compatible with ciphertext uh, being not just zeros and ones, but being arbitrary field elements. The problem is that because you have this MLERAR term, basically, if your messages are not zeros and ones, it makes the error blow up away, right? So you can get some, like you can potentially, instead of working in um, the ring modulo two, you can work in like the ring modulo some small number, like maybe up to 100 or something. Um, but working over things that are not bits, it just kind of seems intrinsically hard because multiplying by things that are not small numbers causes error to uh, blow up very quickly. So no, I mean, you do pretty much, oh. No, sorry, I meant differently. Not, not no. just kind of, not field elements, but instead of like just multiplication, like I know multiple of three different elements or I know some. Oh, yes. Polynomial of four mm. elements, of small degree or something. Right. So I mean, so the trivial way to do any of this, right, is that if you want, well, if you want to like multiply, there are mechanisms for I think multiplying a. Uh, um, so uh, sorry. Uh, so if ML, if the individual ML kind of as bits, right, is just a zero or one then multiplying by three doesn't really have any, right? So if your messages are zero and ones, then you pretty much have to do everything using binary circuits. And the nice thing with binary circuits is that like you can kind of like multiplication is just an addition of a kind of log n left shifted values. And so you can kind of do it. And I mentioned um, before in the optimization session, right, that you can potentially have a ciphertext which uh, contains multiple point texts and you can do shifts. And so you could do a kind of large parts of uh, things like addition and multiplication circuits uh, kind of operating over many, over many bits simultaneously. But I guess in general, like operating over bi binary circuits is the kind of the, the most fundamental thing that, that um, this ends up allowing. There, there are definitely kind of optimizations where if you want to, like, so the main challenge here, right, is to prevent the error from blowing up. Your messages have to always be zero and one, but there are optimizations that have to do with kind of computing more complicated gates in a way that ensures that the output is still uh, the zero and one without um, having to do as much work as if you just kind of did it, na did it naively with simple gates. So there's nothing uh, kind of super mathematically elegant, but there, you know, there are kind of these uh, kind of bags of tricks that, let, that, uh, that let you optimize a lot sometimes. Okay, thank you. One question I have is that people often say that functional encryption is related to FHE. Do you know how to go from FHE to functional mm -hmm. encryption? Or how are they related? Right. So functional, right. So functional encryption, in terms of the definition, basically it means it says instead of being able to go from n of x to n of f of x for arbitrary f, you can go from n of x to just having f of x, but only for one specific f. Um, so it's a kind of different and potentially more powerful <coughs> primitive. In terms of how these functional encryption protocols work, I'll admit I haven't uh, kind of fully figured it, figured this out yet. There's, they're definitely considerably more complicated than FHE. Okay. I mean, I guess one easy way, well, quote easy conceptually, is to to go through obfuscation, bootstrap with FHE, and then go back down to functional encryption. Right, exactly. But even, well, if obfuscation protocols often in practice end up being built on top of functional encryption. So, mm. oh, okay. So, yeah. And there's like a lot of different paths to try to get to obfuscation, and none of them kind of fully satisfy people yet, and they do end up having overhead. Um, one really nice thing is that if you have an obfuscator that works for circuits of constant size, then you can turn that into an obfuscator that works for kind of arbitrary size. 
And the way that you do that is to obfuscate a big program that you first homomorphically encrypt the input, then you have the circuit itself provided in a homomorphically encrypted form. And so basically your function is gonna be circuit evaluation. And so you, you're gonna evaluate the encryption of X with the encryption of the circuit. And then you get an encrypted form of the output and you generate a, a pro some like proof. So think of it as being a snark or something. That, but like you can make you can make proofs that kind of play more nicely with together with the home with the homomorphic encryption scheme so you have less blow up so you basically then what you do is you take your encryption of f of x and you take your proof that you actually computed f and not some different function and then you have a fixed sized uh, program that checks the proof and then decrypts only if the proof is correct and then you have your um your f of x out right so that way you can kind of obfuscate programs so you create a kind of an encrypted program that lets you go from one to f of x. But this still depends on a, a fixed size um, obfuscation. So I think pretty much the exact same technique works for something called um, correlation intractability hashing. And I think the idea here is that um, you can have a, a provably secure fiat shamir as opposed to having a heuristic secure fiat shamir. And then if you have this hash function, which has this very special property on small circuits, then you can, you can boost it to arbitrary circuits. And I think um, hmm. some of the um, lattices people managed to build a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof, which is secure in, 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 the, in, in the standard model without the Mm -hmm. I guess another question I have. That's. Uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. What were you going to say? No, I was just uh, going to say that sounds right and interesting. I mean, the other question I have is on performance. So, like, this one guy said, that, roughly speaking, is a decade, <laughs> like FHE was optimized by an order of magnitude every single year and i was wondering if, mm -hmm. if you think we've, we've hit a like a wall or, or like this is going to continue because it needed to continue for for four or five years and then mm -hmm. it right yeah so i mean I've, I've i've kind of taken you through the journey of a kind of the years of where homomorphic encryption was just getting kind of massively better with new discoveries every two years right so like over here, you have um, boot full, only partial homomorphism, of still bounded degree and bootstrapping is impossible. Then you have this really complicated scheme from Craig Gentry. Then you have this um, really clever trick that allows you, find way, allows you to bootstrap for the first time, but the error flows exponentially. Then suddenly, ta -da, the error only flows up linearly. And then ta -da, now the, the complexity of doing a application can come down to a matrix multiplication. So here, like you were seeing huge speed ups. I, I think after these protocols, the speed ups have definitely started slowing down. And, and I expect speed ups to kind of continue slowing down over time. Um, I, on, I don't know enough to be, uh, to, uh, be able to say, honestly, like what a, uh, a reasonable lower bounds would end up looking like. Like, I think at this, my instinct would say at this point uh, that we'll probably expect to see more speed ups from optimizations than we will by uh, from the kind of very fundamental changes to how ciphertext work. So kind of coming up with gadgets that let, it, let us operate on uh, kind of many bits at the same time more effectively. I don't know. Right. Okay, do we have more questions? I mean, one thing I'm kind of curious about is kind of the, the ultimate kind of cryptographic primitive for the long-term future, let's say when we have quantum computers. And it, it's kind of unfortunate that from what I understand right now, like 
we can't really do snarks uh, with with lattices. And I was wondering right. if, if you think this is like a, a fundamental thing, or like we, we we're gonna mm -hmm. need pry and lattices working in parallel. Huh. So you can you can do bulletproofs with some um, lattices, right? Because you can just use Cypertex the same way you use uh, Patterson commitments. Um, as for in, I, it's very possible that someone will come, someone will come up with some lattice based proto, uh, protocol for kind of zero knowledge proving. I don't know. And I think the reason why it's hard it seems fundamentally harder in the lattice world is because you have these errors, and so you can't really uh, do things like equality tests as easily, right? Like, so like for example, even one of the big uh, kind of pr problems with or challenges that in uh, lot of like this style of uh, cryptography is can you even come up with a zero testing key? And if because of linearity, if you have a zero testing key, you can turn that into an equality testing key, and that would just immediately give you a multilinear map. And it turns out that you know, all of the approaches that people have come up with for trying the zero uh, test of some type of text equals the zero using some key that allows you to do that without allowing you to decrypt everything else. Like it's inevitably leaks information that kind of breaks the, secure, the security proof that shows that you can't extract everything else about the message. So <laughs> yeah, we might end up coming, uh, coming up with uh, something, I don't know. It, it definitely is possible that we'll end up needing both fry and lattices in the, in the long term and that the two things just naturally specialize in different areas. The, the zero testing is very interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of like 10 things where if we had it, then we would just solve everything. So sad. Thank you so much. This was really interesting. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All for Thanks listening. very much.